Thank you. Thank you. Oh my God. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> if we had known it was going to be like this, we would have done it sooner. <laughs> yeah, I know, but, right? But let me just say, there's nothing like being backstage, hearing your boss say, I don't know how they're going to do right <laughs> before you come out. In front of 700 people. So, no boss pressure. Man, thank you. World, the worldwide sensation that is Kimberly Adams. There we go. Holy gee. Holy cow. Oh my gosh, we are so excited to be here. Like they said, this is our first time doing the show live in front of an audience. It's something we've really been wanting to do, and we are super excited to be doing it here in Seattle at Town Hall with KUOW. So thanks to all of you for making this happen. This is perhaps... This is perhaps a redundant question, but how many of you are regular listeners to this particular podcast? Mm. Oh, that's awesome! Sorry, you, sir, in the middle, you didn't raise your hand. Oh? <laughs> Sorry, just kidding. That's okay, you will be now, because right. once you see how that's awesome right. it is, that's right. you so, won't help but listen. <laughs> exactly. So, look, we're going we're gonna to do what might turn out to be a slightly extended play version of our regular <laughs> podcast. We'll have Drew Jost out here, uh, live and in the flesh. You will see what he looks like. Yes, you'll get to see what he looks like. My, my, my favorite part of the night so far is that Kimberly and Drew get bigger applause than I do, which I just kind of <laughs> love. I kind of love that. We'll do regular segments. We're also going to do... Thank you. There you go. Also, so once we get through the, the actual podcast, which is going to drop uh, tonight, actually, so you can go home and listen to it yourselves. Uh, we're going to bring Lindy West out, and Kimberly and I are going to chat with her for yes, a good long while. Exactly. Yeah. So, anyway, thank you for coming. Right. So, we do have a little bit of housekeeping we need to get out of the way first, and so I'm going to read this to you. So, we have to break a little bit of the fourth wall here because we are still doing, you know, an audio show. So, on your way in, you probably received a card for questions, and we are going to do a Q&A uh, Q segment later, and Lindy West is going to be a part of that. So, if you have questions for either of us or Lindy, Write it down on those cards. We have folks circling around who can get those cards from you. And, um, you know, sometimes people like to be a little long-winded with comments, so sorry, that's why you don't have mics. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, it helps, it helps keep things moving. You're all the dice. <laughs> uh, also, about halfway through the podcast portion, we're going to take sort of a fake break, which is where we're going to drop in some, you know, support from our sponsors once it actually comes time to make the podcast. And then because we are re recording the Friday show, at the end you're going to hear us record our show credits, and it's gonna, we're going to say goodbye, but we don't want you to leave, please, and thank you, because we are going to have more to do after that. Yes. We so. absolutely are. So if all of you are ready, Charlton, let's hit it. I know, it happens just like that, I right? I right? I say Charlton, let's hit it. Let's go. Welcome to Make Me Smart Live in Seattle. We're on stage at Town Hall here in downtown. I'm Kai Rizdahl. And I'm Kimberly Adams. Hello, everyone, and thank you for all the folks who are joining us here for our very first live, in-person episode, Seattle Makes a Noise. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Oh, my God, yes. Great. This is so great. This is great. You guys rock. <laughs> now, now I know how Peter Sagal feels. I know, right? We got to do this for every show. I know, right? We're coming back next Friday. What are y'all doing? It's like my, my ego is going to here. <laughs> <laughs> I told you this would be great. I know. <laughs> All right, so this is our Economics on Tap show, which is our version of a happy hour Friday, which means we've got news, but we've also got drinks. And, of course, later on, we're going to be joined by the one and only Drew Jostad, live in the flesh, for our round of Half Full, Half Empty. And he put on a suit for y'all and everything. I know. He put on, like, <laughs> nice clothes. He's a radio engineer. He doesn't usually do that. Anyway, so before we dive into the news, as we usually do, we will start with drinks. Um, two signature drinks of the evening. Who's having the Kimberly Cab out there? Yeah? I would say show of hands. Cheers, what about cheers. the Kai PA, which is the Fremont Brewery Sky Kraken? Hazy? Yes, thank you. Cheers, Excellent, cheers, beer. Cheers. Excellent beer. Excellent um, beer. Tell you what, so we will get going uh, on the news, and, and I've got a couple. I think, though, we have to talk about the news of the day. <laughs> we okay. 
did something happen in the last Some, 24 something hours? Something happened in the last 24 hours. What? So, so look, in, in, the, in the show rundown that we both have on, on our iPads, um, I said, of the indictment, I've got thoughts. Um, so, so here's my thought, and, and look, this is a podcast about business and politics and the culture and society and the economy that we live in. So ordinarily, criminal justice in this country is not something we would do, but this obviously is a blend of many, many things. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm also deeply interested in this just because of my personal experience. As many of you know, probably, if you're regular listeners to the podcast or to Marketplace, I'm a veteran. Spent eight years in the United States Navy. Uh, and, and, I, and I wanted to talk about this uh, for one really big reason. And, and as I think I've said on the podcast before, I, I know I have. If I had done what Donald Trump did, I would be in jail already. I was... When, when I was a lieutenant on my first shore tour in the Navy, I was in the Navy Command Center uh, in the Pentagon, uh, and for whatever reason, um, I was the action officer on a lot of the Freedom of Information Act requests that came in. And I had at the time a top secret SCI clearance, right? I was a Tomahawk plans officer. I did a bunch of stuff. But we got a, we got a Freedom of Information Act request on... Um, aircraft carriers, and I forget the details, but the upshot of the deal is that the, the duty captain in the Navy Command Center handed me this and said, you figure this out, what's classified, what's not, and then we'll send it off. And so I went through it and I, I had a look at everything. And then I came to a line about the, it was, it, it was, a, requ it was about a request for an aircraft carrier visit in a foreign port. And the classified bit of information was the required depth under the keel in port for United States Navy nuclear power aircraft carrier. And I said, well, that's dumb, <laughs> truly, because I was, I was 27 and a lieutenant and I was an aviator and I didn't know anything about nuclear power. And I said, that's dumb. And I said, no, let's release this, forget it. About four days later, the fecal matter hit the rotary device. <laughs> and, and making a long story very short, because of that security lapse on my part, an entire division in the Navy Command Center, 150 people, spent a day on a security standout, right? And they put us in the auditorium, an auditorium, there are many in the Pentagon, and we went over security procedures and requirements and responsibilities of those of us who are trusted with classified information. And again, had I done what Donald Trump did, I would be in jail. And so it's amazing to me to see now the idea that this is somehow a partisan exercise. Mm. And, and that just, I mean, it, it truly, truly bothers me. So that's item number one. My thought number two on this, and jump in whenever you like. I know I'm monologuing here, and yeah, I apologize I for that. But, but look, imagine that, and, and this is not me, this is Tom Nichols who writes for The Atlantic, former War College professor at the Naval War College in, in um, Newport, Rhode Island. Imagine if Vladimir Putin had gotten overthrown somehow in a putsch or whatever, and took with him in his trunk as he went into exile a, a trunk and a half. I mean, you've seen the pictures of the boxes in Mar-a-Lago, but let's in just say- In the bathroom. In the bathroom and in the shower and all kinds of stuff, right? Imagine Putin had taken boxes full of classified information with him. That would be a trove and then displayed it to you know all the babushkas who came by, right? He says non-pejoratively, right? Um, <laughs> That would be a trove of intelligence that American intelligence would really want to get its hands on. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm not able to understand how people don't see this as a legitimate strategic security threat. And that's my spiel. It just bugs the hell out of me. Well, absolutely. And when we think about the people we saw going through Mar-a-Lago. Oh, I know in the last year, year and a half. Um, I have to say, I was, I was reading the indictment before we came out here, and every line I was thinking, somebody got killed. Oh, yeah. Because of this, yeah. you know? And um, it's, pretty <laughs> it's pretty serious, and it's 
I, I, I live in Washington, D.C. I get it. Everybody's got their narrative. Everybody's got their talking points. But it was very fascinating. I was sitting in the airport in Los Angeles when the news came out about the indictment on the way to come here. Um, some people in the airport bar were toasting with champagne. <laughs> some people were very, very quiet, right? And the country is so divided on this that we can't even see what's in front of us. Literal photographs, extreme details, audio recordings, to the point that late uh, last night, one of Trump's lawyers was you know, on TV talking about the seven charges and you know, that it was all made up and it wasn't real, and this morning, Bam. <laughs> yeah. Even they, once they saw it, they're like, nah, man, we're good. <laughs> yeah. And I think that it's going to be very fascinating to see what lawyers he gets yeah. moving forward. He's got one that's helping him out with the New York case at the moment. But um, I really do worry about how our country is going to handle this can information. Can I ask you, actually, let's break a little fourth wall here, right? Yeah. You and Bridget, Bridget Bonner, who's... Oh, God, Bridget, I'm going to screw up your title. She's the director, director of podcasts? Podcast, okay, yes. thank you. Um, and I'm going to hear about this later. Um, uh, you and Bridget were having a conversation, and Bridget basically said, what do you think it's going to take to, to make people understand how grave this is or to change the dynamic, right? Was that the gist of the conversation? Yes, it was. Okay, and your response was? Well, to that one in particular, uh, was this about the parties? Well, it was about what it's going to take, right? And, and yeah, it was the parties, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. So it, I, I, the Republican Party is irredeemable at this point in terms of its dedication to Trump. And I think that even the Republicans who remain fiscal conservatives, who remain social conservatives, who would like to have control of their party have lost their base to Trump. And so it is going to be extraordinarily challenging for them. And I say this as someone who is regularly speaking to people in the Republican Party who are disgusted by what is going on. It's going to be very hard for them to claw back control of that party to the point that I wonder if the party can survive. Right, because Trump controls something like 30 to 40 percent of the Republican base. Right, and the issue that we're having as journalists, and this is all the talk of the Washington press corps, is he's very, 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 very likely to be the Republican nominee for President of the United yep. States, even if he's in jail. I'm serious. Uh, no, I'm, I'm so very look, serious. Here, here, sorry. Go for it. Here, here's what's going to happen, right? He will be indicted. There will be a trial. Sorry, he has been indicted, right? Mm. There will be a trial. He may or may not be convicted. But if he is, he will not be actually sent to jail, right? He'll be on some kind of home confinement, and he'll have an ankle bracelet. And he's going to go to a convention, and he's going to say, this is what they did to me. The fundraising emails, fundraising emails that were going out from Republican campaigns last night said things to the effect of, first, they're coming after him. Next, they're going after right. you. That's yeah. what it said, yeah. right? And so I think that this is so precarious for us as a country. And I think this is the reason why we're not seeing the special counsel talk. This is the reason they're being so careful about jurisdiction. And you know, they were saying today they want everyone to read it. It's, you know, this is a little bit outside of our, our lane in terms a little of bit, how but, deep. But look, but, I'm, but I'm okay, it, it, but it's important. It's it, important. It so deeply matters. And I, I, see, I see people in Washington who really do care about conservative values and conservative ideals, who have strong opinions on abortion and religion and all of the other things and how we run the country and how we handle taxes that wish with all of their heart and soul that that's what Republicans were talking about. Right, right. But they can't anymore because all they can talk about is Trump. And that's all that they can't, they can't talk against him because he has such a hold on the Republican base. And that makes it really hard for us as journalists to figure out how to talk about this. Because for a long time, the Washington press corps was like, eh, we're just going to deny him oxygen. He's no longer president. He you know, is saying lies all the time. We're just going to ignore it. We can't do that anymore, right? So what do we do? What's the responsible thing for us as journalists to do? 
and we're still figuring it out. Boy, that's a whole other podcast. We yeah, no, actually... I'm sorry. Well, no, no, look, I mean, rabbit uh, hole. <laughs> no, it's 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 fundamental, right? It's mm -hmm. deeply, deeply critical to who we are as a country. But we got other stuff we got to talk about. Yeah, we got other stuff right. we got to talk about. What's you your, do, your okay. yours is more fun. All right. Nah, not so, fun. It's well, more I'm, economic. Well, I'm not, not going to do the boring one. I'm not going to do the debt limit one because we're all just sick and tired of the debt limit. And, and look, if you want to talk more, I know, I know, I know. Well, just I know. <laughs> just wait. Soon we'll be talking about the potential government shutdown. Yeah, no, we're not, we're not talking about any of that. I just, here's a little news you can use. Uh, I'm sure you saw the other day, a week or two ago, that Netflix is going to crack down on password sharing. So those of you out there who are children of, network, of Netflix subscribers, you're doomed. <laughs> My kids are pissed, I will tell you. The, the three that live away from home are deeply, deeply upset. But here's the really interesting thing. So Antenna is a company that tracks these sorts of subscription and, and password sharing numbers. It says that in the four days after Netflix announced that it was going to come after US-based password sharing, because it's been doing it overseas for about a year, year and a half now. In the four days after it happened, the company averaged 70 new th signups a day, 100,000 on two days of those four days. So clearly the company now, Ted Sarandos, God love him, he's got to spend a bajillion dollars on content, and he sees a revenue stream. So all of you who are sharing your parents' passwords, or perhaps the other way around, mm -hmm. um, just get ready to start shelling out, I don't even know what it is, 14 something dollars a month, $8 a month, if you want the ad-supported tier. Um, that's coming to you, and Netflix can see the dollar signs on the wall. Well, and also the other streaming companies can see the dollar oh, sure. signs on the oh, wall because sure. they're watching. Oh, sure. Nobody wanted to go first with cracking down on password right. sharing. Right. Netflix took the plunge. We're going to see it with Disney Plus. We're going to see it with, what is it called now? Max. They're, Max. <laughs> just, right. I Max. still haven't downloaded the new version of it. It's just like, really? <laughs> that wasn't, anyway, sorry. Cr Cr Chris Licht is the least of David Zaslav's problems. <laughs> but anyway. A little inside baseball. Anyway, what do you got? What's your other I one? think that uh, we are going to see that with a lot more yeah. streaming services yeah. as everybody's tightening their belt. We talked on the show the other day about the struggles in the media industry, all the layoffs, and uh, everybody's looking for where they're going to get revenue, yeah. which is why we're so grateful to all of you. Thank you yep. for keeping us on air. Appreciate it. Okay, so mine is a very interesting take on the economy, courtesy of uh, the New York Times and our wonderful guest who often joins you on Friday, Gina Smiley. Gina Smiley, I love Gina. Yeah. Right. So she has, uh, she along with one of her colleagues, has a story in the New York Times. <laughs> what all the single ladies and men say about the economy. <laughs> Which Think about it, it. think about it. Think yeah. about it. Pause for dramatic effect. Okay. All the single ladies. <laughs> so basically, there's a big... Sorry, I did a little song and she laughed and so I said, okay. When was the last time you heard me sing on this podcast? Like, like never. Like two days ago. Well. <laughs> You, okay. You whatever. sing the Ferris Bueller song like right before air every oh, well, single time. <laughs> so, okay. So, you know, all right. So, I don't actually know how often that winds up on the actual podcast, but when I sit down in my shed, which is attached to my garage, and Kimberly's <laughs> in her apartment in Washington, I sit down and I, I take the mute button off and I go, for whatever stupid reason, I go, chicka chicka, chicka chicka. <laughs> oh, yeah. He does. <laughs> every time. I. I I, I legit don't know why I do that, except I like how it sounds. And, but I don't think that's singing. It's not me singing all the single ladies, you know, whatever. All the single ladies. Where's my Thank friend you. over there? Wonderful. All right. Anyway, sorry. Speaking of movies. What? Oh, stop. <laughs> no, I have Nobody to tell you that. this. Okay, go ahead. When I was on the plane on the way to Los Angeles, I watched, for the first time ever, what? Top Gun. Did you really? <laughs> So wait, so, all right, wait, wait, no, 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 wait, wait, because uh, this is, I'm about to make a very important clarification. Top Gun, the original? The original. Or, okay, all right, the good. The original. Good, good. Yes. Have I, have I given you my spiel on Top Gun, the no, original, and why I won't see part right two? Now. Okay, so I will not go see Top Gun part two, what's it, like Maverick, is that what it's called, right? Okay, I will not go see it, because in 1986 when Top Gun came out, I was in flight school in Pensacola, and I went to go see the original in my whites, in a theater in Pensacola, 
and look, let's not pos- put this in the actual podcast that airs, but, <laughs> but, but it was, there, I was, it was, I was not suffering for a lack of attention, shall we say. <laughs> Anyway, oh, yes on the original, boo on Maverick. All right. But you know what this means, right? I know what this means. Now I owe you one, and I can't even remember the name of the Thank movie you. I'm supposed to see. Never Ending Story. Yes, you have to watch Never Ending Story. It's only fair. It is, it is only fair. It is only there was fair. a right. lot of testosterone in anyway. that movie. Anyway, so, 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 okay, so wait, so wait, 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 and, th- and then we'll get back on track. Sorry, it's a, is it a Christmas movie? No. Oh, all right. I thought that was my out. I thought I could wait till Christmas and you would forget. No. Sorry. That's right. like, what's that movie that everybody says is a Christmas movie? No, not Die, Die Hard. Hard. Die Hard is a Christmas movie, Yeah, that's that, that's the one I was thinking fight, of. That's fight the one me on I was that thinking one. of. I, fight I, I me was. on that one. Okay. Die Hard is a Christmas movie. So anyway, I was talking about <laughs> jewelry, right? Jewelry. Signet Jewelers had news this week that they are not doing so great selling engagement rings. Why is this? Because apparently, <laughs> let me just read it. Singles who were stuck at home during lockdowns failed to meet their would-be fiancés in 2020. That's true. Therefore, I guess it takes three a lag years time, right? to get somebody to put a ring on it. And therefore, now they're struggling to sell engagement rings plus inflation. So... I thought that was very interesting because there's so many different ways that you can look at the economy, right? And so yeah, many totally. different little nuances. I never thought to look at engagement rings as an economic indicator, but sure. God bless Juno Smilak. God bless Juno Smilak. Anyway. I know, right. Okay, that's it for our news fix. I know that was a little extended. We are going to take a quick break, and then when we come back, you're finally going to meet Drew Jostad, who's going to join us live, live on, stage. on stage for Half Full, Half Empty. You guys are awesome. (laughs) This is Make Me Smart live from Town Hall on the stage in Seattle, Washington. Thank you so much for being with us for a special live episode. Yes. All right. So I know you all have been waiting for this. Who is ready to play a round of Half Full, Half Empty? Me. All right, so that means we bring out the host of our show, Drew Jostad. Come Drew. on down. <laughs> so does, what you need to know about like Drew? Thought he would. What you need to know about <laughs> Drew is this is probably like top two in his like worst nightmares, right? <laughs> Close? Top one? Yeah, yeah, no, it's, 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 it's up there. It's up there. I, I should I, say, he's been on stage before. He's a musician. He yeah. performs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yes. it's, it's been a while since college, but... <laughs> there you go. Sorry. Look, they love you, man. They love you. <laughs> All right, are we ready to play? Music means we are. Okay, so the game is called... Half full, half empty. Drew is going to run through some topics, and we are going to tell you how we're feeling about them, positively and negatively. We don't mind a little audience participation, but at the end, we're really going to need you to weigh in in a big way. So, Drew, take it away. First topic, with lawsuits against Binance on Monday and Coinbase on Tuesday, are you half full or half empty on the SEC crypto crackdown? Okay, I am half full on it continuing, but also half full on the looming fight over who gets to crap down. Yeah, crap so, down. So actually, <laughs> the, it's the wine the, on the, crypto. No, well, that I mean, give us the dorky regulatory explainer, right? Okay. Because th- that briefly, briefly, briefly. 
There are many different government agencies. Several of them want a piece of crypto. And where in the regulatory framework it falls, it has to do with whether it's a commodity or if it's a security. A security. Right. And Securities and Exchange Commission, which means they would be considering them securities versus the Commodities Futures Trading Commission, right. which would mean it would be a commodity, and nobody really knows. Plus, Congress is trying to do what it's going to do while trying to still figure it out. So everybody is worried about it. Everybody's cracking down on it. Meanwhile, what was it? Binance lost like $4 billion yep. <laughs> yep. in uh, outflows over the last couple of days. Right. So half empty on crypto in the future, even though I know you think it's the future. And half full on the crackdown. Yeah, to totally agree, right? The other part of this is Coinbase, which is a publicly traded company, right? And which is a legit business, which is also being sued. So the, the SEC or whoever winds up regulating this thing is gonna have to figure out which are at real actual companies and which are like, oh, I don't know, like FTX, <laughs> kind of a show game, right? So it's a really challenging thing to figure out with a whole new kind of what will eventually be real money. But I'm half full on, on the SEC looking closer, for sure. Okay. Next topic, half full or half empty on the series finale of Succession. What? Oh. Why, why is that funny? I think it's because of the face I just made. Oh, what, you, <laughs> what did you do? I've, I've never watched it. No, oh my God. <laughs> okay, all right. So, so I'll take this one, but honestly, just watch like two episodes. Like on the plane home, download it. I'll give you my HBO we live Max. Succession. I'll, I'll, I'll give you my Max password. I have no. I I have Max. Thank you very much. Well, once I download the new app. But anyway, I look. We live this stuff every day, and we cover it every day. I want to watch anime when I get home. Mm. <laughs> All right. Here's, I want to be entertained. Here's, here, here, here's here's why I want you to watch it. Okay. <laughs> Excuse me. And this is in all seriousness. If you watch Never Ending Story. Fine, yes. Okay. But, but look, I, I want you to watch it for the writing and the craft. I hear the music is good, too. Music's amazing. Yeah. Charlton, do you have that back there? If you were on the ball, pal, you have <laughs> um, I love Charlton Thorpe. Come on. Charlton um, Seriously, for the, for, the, for the acting and for the writing and for the craft. Okay. You, ju you just should. Julie, um, you watched it? So, one season. Which one? The first season. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> look, there are people who jump in in season three. Uh, so would you, uh, you stopped, I guess. I stopped. Not a big TV guy. All right. Okay. Uh, okay. So yeah, I guess my happen. vote's the only one that counts here, except for yeah. all y'all. So, so by sound of applause, who really liked the Succession series finale? Okay. You, sir, who raised your hand, were doing radio. Raising hands doesn't count. Uh, and who did not like it? Okay, all right, so those of you who like it wins. Look, I, I <laughs> wait, what? All right, anyway, uh, I really liked it. I thought it was great. I thought it was great that all, uh, well, I'm not gonna tell you, well, whatever. No spoilers. I liked it, I thought it was amazing. I thought it was really well done. I thought four seasons and we're out, boom, done. It was great. Half full. Maybe I'm just like traumatized from the end of Game of Thrones and I don't want to invest uh, no, in Oh, that was so terrible. A, I don't want to invest that in so something terrible. again. Yeah, no. All right, what's no. the next one? And it was so much work to get to the Game of Thrones finale. I, I know. All right, anyway, sorry. You, We're like over time here. Bridget's going, what are you doing? You tried to get out of this one, but are you half full or half empty on the debt ceiling deal? <laughs> oh, fuck me. Seriously? <sighs> so I don't know if that's going to come on the microphone, but I actually said it that <laughs> Um Oh my God. So, yay, there was a debt ceiling deal. Oh my God, the debt ceiling is the stupidest way to run the most important economy on the planet. I, I, don't, I don't understand. I, 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 I don't understand. And the thing that drives me crazy uh, about the debt limit is that if you go back to 1917 and the Second Liberty Bond Act of that year, it was all about making it, e history matters, it was all about making it easier for the government to borrow money instead of harder. And now it's become this political cudgel and kill me. <laughs> uh, I mean, half full that it's done, all the way empty on it actually meaning something. Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> because for sure. as I did a story for your show, yeah. it's moving money around for theatrics. Right. It, 
changes a few things, it's a few things in meaningful ways, but for the most part, it's a cop out. Right. And what we're doing is we're setting up the federal agencies for some really tough decisions that they shouldn't be saddled with in this way. And I don't know if it's actually, it, it might help us avoid a government shutdown, showdown uh, in the fall, but maybe not. Um, as you said, this is a shitty way to run a government. <laughs> I added extra Ooh. layers to it. I'm sorry. You have to put the E on this, Bridget. Sorry. Br Next. Bridget's, Bridget's going to yell at you. <laughs> I know. I'll take it. <laughs> Next. Half full or half empty on the rise of TikTok dupes. Oh, so this is a story I did the other It's an interview I did the other day about this thing that I knew nothing about, which is this thing that's a trend on TikTok where you see something you like, um, but you want a cheaper version of it, so you go in search of it, and it gets wrapped up in influencers and rabbit holes of chasing things on TikTok and internet mysteries. And I, I guess I'm, I'm half full on, on people wanting to get cheaper versions of things they like, but still, here we are all these years later, the influencer economy just baffles me, <laughs> just baffles me. I'm going to go half empty only because I do think a lot of these luxury goods are vastly overpriced, oh, sure. but I'm never going to think that when I buy a $20 purse that someone's making a livable wage. So mm -hmm. half empty. For sure. For sure. <laughs> This week, the PGA Tour announced... Ooh. Ooh. People wow. have feelings. You guys have some feels. <laughs> Big feelings. I think we do the poll on Big this one, yeah, too. Yeah, let's do the crowd. poll on this one. All Heavy right, golf go crowd. It. All right, so we're going to do the poll on this one since you all have big feelings, although I guess we already know the answer. Um, so we're going to do it by a round of applause. Once Drew actually gets to read it, <laughs> we're going to ask you who's half full and who's half empty, and by the sound of your applause, you can let us know. All right, Drew, what's the topic? Well, I, I guess I'm going to say, are you half full or half empty on the possible merger? between the PGA Tour and Live Golf, right. or partnership, or whatever they want to call wait, wait. it. We need a clarification here on whether or not it's going to happen, well, or whether or not it's a good thing. How about just the proposed idea? Let's not complicate yeah, it. Proposed right. idea. Whether, right. Yeah, whether or not it's a good so, thing is probably all, more broad. All, all, all in favor of PGA and Live getting together, clap your hands wildly. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> and thus, all opposed. Amazing what happens when you murder journalists and oppress women. People oh don't goodness. seem to like you very much. Stunning. Stunning. I think, I, I think the yes to all of that, I think the other part of this is the sheer hypocrisy of Jay Monahan, the, the commissioner mm. of the PGA, who goes, right. Right. Um, <laughs> just disgraceful. So half empty. I think we're kind of over our time. <laughs> we're, we're, we're fine. We're, it's yeah, our show. Do we we're getting, we're let's do another close. open poll. Go for it. Uh, well, I got two more. What, should yeah, I why do not? both of them? So right. We're fine. It's we're a fine. game. We're having fun. We're five minutes over, and we started late anyway. Yeah, that's it. Half full or half empty on the mermaid economy? <laughs> oh. So while you all think about your answers, <laughs> I will say this has been one of the more interesting stories that I've done for Marketplace because uh, when they announced that The Little Mermaid was going to be remade into a live action show, I had already at that point achieved my mermaid certification. <laughs> Which is a real thing you can get because my niece, who was like ten or like eleven or twelve at the time, wanted to be a mermaid in the pool, and because I'm paranoid, I wanted to make sure I could m like do the mermaid thing safely. So I went and I got myself a mermaid certification, got the card, took the class, 
is really hard. You have to like swim underwater for 80 feet with your sh legs strapped together in a mono fin and hold your breath and try to look cute. It's, it's a lot. Um, and of course, by the time I finished it, she was so over it because now she's 13 and doesn't care about anything. <laughs> That's Just the best part right too there. Too cool for anything now. But there is this huge industry around mermaids that I had no idea about. You have years long waiting lists for $5,000 mermaid tails. And Say that again. That was the thing that blew. So Kimberly did a story for us and she did two stories for morning. These fins cost $5,000. The lower priced ones. So that you can get like ones for 99 bucks on like Amazon, but like if you get the silicone ones that are like custom made, they range from like $5,000 to $20,000. And there are years long waiting lists for these. So some people buy expensive purses, some people buy silicone mermaid tails and play in the water. And it's a growing industry and they are, there was a Netflix, um, you know, docu-series about it, and I got to talk to all of these mer people for the story, and, you know, people are living out, like, their childhood dreams, and it makes them really happy, and there's a lot of, like, body positivity movement layered on to it, and ocean conservation, and people are like, yeah, you know, it's grim out here. I just want to play around in the water with my friends. So you're a half full, I'm a half full, because Kimberly's I'm half full, and there we go. half full. Okay, wait, wait. Yeah. Well, we ruined it now. Okay, so what? who's half we're, full on the mermaid industry? Sorry, <laughs> were we supposed to poll on that one? Sorry, my bad, my bad. If you're half empty, you don't like fun. So we're moving on to the next time. Right. You're a hater. Don't be a hater. <laughs> All right, last one. I don't want to start a food fight with any of our wonderful hosts here in the Emerald City. Oh but are you half full or half empty on having a hot dog with cream cheese and grilled onions? Oh my god. Also known Seriously? as... Seriously? Uh, that's not actually a thing, right? So let's right? poll. Let's poll. Okay. Who's half full on the Seattle-style hot dog? Wow. I would, I would just like to note that Karen Mathis... Says no, she's not. She's not clapping. <laughs> oh, no. You think I haven't been watching you this whole time? <laughs> Who's half empty, Karen? <laughs> <laughs> so wait. So, so for reals, it's a hot dog in a bun with cream cheese and what, relish? Uh, caramelized onion seems to be the most popular, but you can put anything you want on it. It's America, pal. You can do it's whatever you want. It's cream cheese that makes it Seattle. Cream cheese is, seems to be the most important thing. Yeah, and like a white hot dog bun it was originally sort of a bagel-ish dough. I read the whole article. <laughs> <laughs> Seattle I'm, Times. I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a pass. I'm, in, I'm half empty. You know me. I know, I, I know. Now you hate me. Now you hate me. Look, my cop out is that I don't do, do any kind of cheese, so it's not my oh. fault. It's not Seattle, it's cheese. Boo. So, mm. half empty. <laughs> so, um, All right. I'll be the half full one up here. Thank there you go. You. Yeah. All, right. All right. We're done? Is yes. that it? This is why everybody loves Drew. Is that it? Yeah. Yes, that's it. All, All right. right. Ladies and gentlemen, Drew Jostad, <laughs> live and in the flesh. Amazing job. Well, I hope poor, everybody poor enjoyed the game. Poor Drew. I know, Drew. bless his heart. <laughs> All right, so for those listening to the podcast, that is it for us tonight. We appreciate you joining us for Make Me Smart Live in Seattle. One yeah, more buddy. time. Go figure. Yeah. This has been so much fun, and as always, we love to hear from you because we cannot do the show without you. So you can send us your thoughts, comments, suggestions, ways of eating hot dogs. <laughs> I don't get <laughs> to it. To make me smart at marketplace.org or leave us a voicemail at anybody. Yes. 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 Five zero eight. You be smart. Thank uh, you, everyone. <laughs> best fan ever, right over there. Oh my goodness. We still gotta do the credits. Make Me Smart is produced by Courtney Bergseeker. Today's episode was engineered by Charlton Thorpe in the back of the room there, Drew Jostad. 
wrote the theme music to our game, Half Full, Half Empty. The team behind our Friday game is Emily McCune and Antoinette Brock. Marissa Cabrera, who's wandering around, is our senior producer. Bridget Bodner, also here, is the director of podcast. And joined by Francesca Levy, who is our executive director of digital and on-demand, sure. And Marketplace's vice president and general manager, who y'all saw earlier, Neil Scarborough. And a special thanks tonight to KUOW's events team. And thank you so much to Town Hall in Seattle for hosting us here tonight. We appreciate it. Good night, everybody. So Such there a you fun go. Crowd. How about that? I huh? know. For reals, we're coming back next Friday. Yeah. For reals. Can we? <laughs> right? Come on. We got to take the show on the road. All right. So, anyway, uh, more to come. We're going to bring Lindy West out in a minute. We're going to do uh, a QA with Lindy uh, on the stage afterward. If you've got uh, those cards that the producers gave you on the way in, um, write whatever questions you might have. We've got a bunch backstage already. Um, but there will be probably a producer or two, uh, Marissa or Bridget or Francesca or Yeah, if you uh, want to meet Courtney the people we back. talk about in the credits all the time, know, they're right? wandering around. You can see them, too. I know. Uh, fill out those cards and give it to one of the producers, and we'll, um, we'll see if we can work it in. Yeah. All right. So I know that you all have been waiting for this. Yes. This is my theory, by the way, that you all are here to see Lindy. Like, yeah, I know. It's okay. We're right? here to see her, too. <laughs> okay, so without further ado, we don't need any more time to waste. Our special guest tonight is Seattleite Lindy West. Welcome to the stage. Thank you for joining us. Yeah. We, we will start, uh, as we always do, with uh, uh, Friday afternoons on this program. What are you drinking? Having a white wine. White wine. <laughs> I have no more information. But. That's all right. It's, it's is that number two or number three? Sure. Are we three? It's two? number two. All right. But well, I feel like I a saw weird the stash back there. That. I saw the stash. That's all I'm saying. This is, this is number it's two. It's a heavy for me pour, also. I will say number that. Three for me. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Can I, can I do the bio? Yes, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. All right. You all already know her, but we want to do the full introduction of her amazingness. Lindy West is the author of several books, including her best-selling memoir, Shrill Notes from a Loud Woman. Let's hear it. the book which was adapted into a Hulu series. She's also the co-founder of Reproductive Rights Destigmatization Campaign, Shout Your Abortion. And Lindy's work has appeared all over, including in the New York Times, The Guardian, This American Life. I was listening to your conversation with our good friend, Noel King, about your last book, which was fun. And apparently your newsletter is the most important newsletter of all time. It's true, actually. Everyone's saying it, and they're saying it more and more. <laughs> could, <laughs> just, could we get the name of the newsletter out there, please? Um, I think you, you can say the name of it. Yes, Kai. <laughs> no. But <Yeah>. news. <laughs> oh my god, I talked over you saying it. <laughs> like, I'll, do, I'll do it in the clear. Everybody, okay. hold on. But news. <laughs> and this is why we love you, Kai. Uh, look, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, what, uh, anyway, <laughs> so look, let's, I, I don't want... <clears throat> mm. Kimberly and I started with a very serious moment. You yes. were watching backstage, listening, whatever? Of course. Okay. Riveted. Um, I, I would... <laughs> Riveted. <laughs> um, I don't know. I wonder how that's going to show up in the transcript. Um, so look... Better than Tom's transcript. I, I, I would... Uh, you are an observer of many, many things. Life in this society and economy most particularly. I would like your sense of how things are going right now. <laughs> That, that's, a legit, that's a legit question. In, in, in the life of the world? Just well, in general? No, not the world. This, this country right now. It, it's amazing. I mean, I, I've the best country in the world. I love it. I mean, no, no. It's like, a, it's a hellish. I don't know what... <laughs> um, how is this country going is the question. 
uh, seems bad, <laughs> right? It seems like um, uh, an endurance test, uh, and we're all being pushed closer and closer to um, madness and death. <laughs> um, is that the right answer? It, it is what it is. It's an answer. I mean, it really, like, uh, honestly, I have stopped writing about politics. I've stopped engaging with the news because it's um, really grim. Say, say more. Say why you've, un tell, tell me why you've unplugged. Well, I first, so I was writing regularly for the New York Times, writing opinion pieces up until I think I stopped in like early 2017. Yeah. And it was Trump. <laughs> and, but not because it was so depressing. It was like, as a writer whose job it is to come up with an original take every week, what do you say? What Very quickly say? it became, yeah. oh my God, what do I say? What do you say? Oh, the, the man made the worst possible choice again. <laughs> the man did a crime again and no one cared. I mean, it was just, I felt, I felt trapped in this corner where my only option was to write the same column over and over again. Um, which just didn't feel very good for me as a creative person and also part of a kind of, I don't know, unhelpful economy of opinion economy that was just kind of spinning its wheels and not taking us anywhere. And it just felt really sad. <laughs> yeah. Do you feel like you could write a different column today because you're saying committing crimes and nothing happening? He's been indicted. That's true. Happy indictment day. Uh, again. Not our first indictment day. Um, I mean, I don't know. What, I, I, I feel like I've lost all um, footing to guess at what's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I don't know. It, he, it, what? Okay. I mean, he, he's still the, the front runner for the Republican nomination, which he very probably will win, and then he could still become the president and, I don't know, exonerate himself for his many crimes. So I, like, I really um, feel like what I can do in my life is build community with people around me that I care about. There you go. There you go. There you go. I, I don't know... And that's always how it's been, right? Like, local action has always been where we need to start. Yeah, yeah, but I think when you were trying to build local action before, you had general underlying support, right? That there was a general ethos of, listen, we kind of have to work together. And I wonder if what you're saying is, because this is what I'm saying, that's kind of gone now. You mean like bipartisan? Well, not even bipartisan, but just generally aisle? shared experiences and commonality, right? And, and it seems like that ain't it. I don't know, man. <laughs> yeah. right. anyway. Sorry. I mean, I you mean, mean like everyone is siloed and angry and, yeah. uh, you know, afraid. And, and also, I mean, the, you know, I, of course, a Trumper would call this like partisan hackery or whatever, but they, there's no, you can't talk to them. Yep. What are you supposed to do? You can't talk. I mean, it, it's, it, it's such an extreme, radical, fringe viewpoint that, that has been. Uh, relentlessly hammered into us that, that it isn't fringe. You know, they've been like legitimizing themselves uh, deliberately and systematically for years. And now we're supposed to, you have to do so much work to get back to anything that the far right is saying that even is based in truth and reality. So I don't know, how do you, um, how do you engage with that? You, there's, they don't want to build with us. They want to, um, uh, grind us into nothing, which is why it's important to stay, um, honestly, I mean, I, I sound like I'm being flippant, but it is actually really important to stay in a place of um, community and honestly hope. Uh, not, it's really, really helpful to the far right for people who care about things like um, equality and justice and voting rights and abortion and basic uh, human rights to um, it, it's really uh, helpful for them when we get ground down and um, give up much like I did on my New York Times column <laughs> there we go anyway well right. um, 
you know, you've also given up on some platforms on social media, and <laughs> way before a lot of other folks, no <laughs> myself regrets. included. But I couldn't help but notice when I was looking at Shrill, um, I'm just gonna read this section. Unfortunately, my first troll, the first time an anonymous stranger called me fat online, was years before I discovered fat liberation. It was posted in the comments of some innocuous blog entry on June 9th, 2009, at 11.54 p.m., what would become a major turning point in my life. Uh. So happy troll anniversary! Oh, my God! Uh. Well done, huh? <laughs> wow, I can't believe you caught that. That is <laughs> unreal. She Wait, pays what attention, year was, Kimberly Adams. 2009, does. so that's how long 14 ago? 14 years. 14 years ago? I've just been in, tortured. In two hours, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was, um, that was here in Seattle at The Stranger. It was almost certainly a Seattleite. We had mostly a Seattle readership. So if you're here, thank you. <laughs> for, uh, I mean, I got a lot of, I got a lot of you know, um, good material out of that. So thanks, honestly, I guess. How has it changed, <laughs> though, if it has? Well, I left Twitter, so I'm not on Twitter. And that's the... That's, Collectively. If, yeah. yeah. <laughs> If you're looking to be an abusive internet troll, Twitter is the place. <laughs> um, they don't really find me on Instagram. Instagram isn't really built. I mean, you can, you can see, I don't know anything about the internet, uh, <laughs> but you can really see how the, um, the platform itself of Twitter is just optimized. The interface is optimized for torturing people. Mm. Whereas on Instagram, it's like really, if you respond to a comment, you can't find it again. Like it's like, it's so amazing. It makes it so hard to be horrible to people. So, um, I mean, obviously it's still bad and social media is killing us all, but it, it's, but I mean, my life's quieter now. You got out of Twitter so far ahead of <laughs> the rest of us. Yeah. Um, what does it feel like watching it crash and burn now? I love it. I love it. Yeah. I love it. I yeah. love it so much. I love it so much. I mean, it's also bad. <laughs> uh, there, I think I, I haven't reread Shrill in a million years, but I think I write about the good things about Twitter. There were good things about Twitter, um, helpful things, but it's bad. <laughs> I, I don't think it could have been saved. I think this was a, you know, foregone conclusion. So, sort of fun. Although. What is going? I don't even know what's going on with it now. Are people still on it, like regular people? Yeah, regular people are, but it still sucks. In fact, it's worse now, right? I mean, I mean, it's got to be worse. chaos where yeah. anyone can be verified. Yeah, that's it's, so it's, funny. It's way lousy. I look at it for like DMs, but that's about it at this right. point. Yeah, <laughs> which right. are worse than they used to be. Great. <laughs> right. Um, can we talk writer strike here for a minute? Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. You're I'm a writer. Yes, and I'm on strike, although I don't have a job. So. I was just going to say, <laughs> what's, what's it like to be a writer on strike when you don't have a job to strike? I wish I had a job to strike from. Then I would have health insurance to strike from. Ugh. No, but um, of course, like I love my union, and I support my fellow writers. And it really is like... Even just in the... You know, I guess I've been working in TV for maybe five years at this point. I think we started working on The Shrill Show in 2017, maybe 2018. Um, so maybe six years, I don't know. But I, you can feel it already, you, like you can feel the sort of atrophy of yeah. um, the, the support for writers. Right. Um, you know, I don't, and I, I, I've only made one show and it was a streaming show. I don't get residuals. I, I'm like, I shouldn't say this on, Marketplace, whatever. Like I'm broke. Like I had a TV mm -hmm. show, and you, you I should like, absolutely say that. Yeah, because that's yeah, what I was gonna ask you next. So, no, say it again. <laughs> yeah, but you're, my mom's gonna listen. She's gonna be like, "You're what?" <laughs> but I think that's important because you had a, t a, a show, a right. streaming show. You have multiple books. You're a very widely respected published author, and yet we were just talking backstage about you trying to make rent. I, 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 I make rent you know every month. So well. Thank you, That's Courtney. what I do. And rent in <laughs> yeah. Seattle sucks. Right. Um, and I... Yeah. I do not own a home. Uh, and like, okay, some of this is that I am irresponsible. Um, but 
some of it is that the system in general is not set up for individual people to succeed and grow and be comfortable. It's set up for us to be desperate and stressed uh, beyond our capacity. I mean, like... Hey, you're doing the cameos. Ex I mean, yeah, exactly. I mean, like, I'm truly, like, living on butt news. <laughs> My email newsletter, which I'm, like, begging for money. <laughs> like, please subscribe to butt news. <laughs> Um, and, you know, and I'm exaggerating, like I also have a book that I'm working on and, you know, when I turn in the book I get paid and it's not, I, I'm not in dire straits, but it is not the same as the way that the TV industry used to work, mm -hmm. where, you know, people are still watching my show, I don't get, and, and the thing with these streamers is that they're totally opaque, we don't know how many people watch our show, uh, we don't know how many people even, I don't think, I don't think they even release like how nope. many people subscribe to Hulu. Mm -hmm. they, we know nothing about their financials and so they get to define the whole narrative and be like, oh, boo hoo, we're broke. <laughs> Which is like, I don't think that's true. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. And also, sounds like a YP. That sounds like your problem. And mm. you took my work to make money off of, and so you should pay me. I mean, then they, they paid me, you know, for the first time around, but mm -hmm. I just know so many writers that are struggling and scared, you know? And it's, you know, I, I would love to have a job, and I have struggled to find a job as a creator of a TV show, because the writer's rooms are getting smaller, blah, blah, blah. So, number one, next time we do a live show, let's build in restroom breaks. <laughs> I told you to go before we came number, out here. Number two, they have speakers in the restrooms back here, so that's amazing. <laughs> so to that point you were just making, you are cre... <laughs> what? What? <laughs> okay. You so, basically uh, sorry, just said out sorry, loud. Hold You're, on. Uh, in, uh, I, can, I can do two things at once. Can I just say? Incredible butt news tie-in. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. All, all I... <laughs> My, my, my life goal Ooh. now is to make it to butt news. <laughs> I think it okay. happened, Kai. Right, I think wait. it happened. So hold on. Actually, t in all seriousness, to the point you were just making, um, you are deeply stressed about a lot of things, the state of the world, your own finances, and yet you have to be creative. How do you do that? Oh. I mean, I really... <laughs> I mean, there's a reason why my book's not done. The only thing that will save me from financial ruin, and I am like, I sit in my office and I watch YouTube videos about snakes. You know, like, I just, I'm like. So, I'm sorry, is this a book about snakes? I just like snakes. Oh, all right. I don't know. I was, telling, <laughs> I was telling one of your producers that I, uh, I really am just like a weird woman who likes animal facts, and I avoid politics, and I um, and I write about I write a newsletter called Butt News. So I <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, have you ever watched a video of a snake drinking water? No. It's incredible. No. It's so. How do they drink water? How, how they, do they stick do it? their little snoot in the water, and they go. Gluh, gluh, gluh. <laughs> It's unreal. It is not how you expect snakes to drink water, and you gotta go check it out. We will. We will, for we'll, sure. We'll, we'll put that on the show page. We'll put yeah, that we'll put it on, on the video show on the show page. But, um, yeah, being creative in distress is really, really hard. I mean, and, and it's, listen, this is a champagne problem. Like, I acknowledge... I, I don't I, think it actually is. Well, no. but I mean... No. I have a really cool job that's fun, and I actually am fine, and I have lots of opportunities, and I'm really grateful. Uh, but... Like anyone else, I mean, even just living with imminent climate catastrophe, like we're all just like uh, in this vice of stress and how are any of us supposed to get our jobs done or even Fair feel point. like what we're doing is real, <laughs> you know, yeah. or that the future is real. Sorry. Well, now, I feel, <laughs> now I feel a little bit bad about my next question, which is going to make it worse. Okay, great. Let's do it. Um, how are you feeling about AI? <laughs> wow. My husband will not stop sending me videos about the AI, like, Photoshop thing, where you can just yeah. be like, oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I, I'm like, can you please stop, like, bullying me with, 
this nightmare. Um, Specifically for your writing and for your work. I, I don't know. I mean, I haven't, I haven't tried to tell an AI to write uh, an edition of Butt News in the voice of Lindy West. I don't think it could do it because I, as I said, am a freak. But <laughs> I don't know. It, I mean, it's really scary. And there's a lot of writers who do different kinds of writing from what I do that are very, very much going to be impacted. You know, people who write, like, copy for things that, yeah. you know, yeah. things that are a little bit less voicey than what I do. Like um, business and financial news, perhaps? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I wasn't going <laughs> to specify, <laughs> but... <laughs> I mean, drinks. <laughs> what was that? I I don't know if it's I, illegal to talk about other podcasts, but sure. Oh no, go please. For it. Planet that Money Planet did it. Money yeah. Episode. So that Planet was, Money did a AI generated episode. It was unbelievable. Like it did the voices. It wrote the script. I don't know how. I don't know what we do with that. It's just I. Okay, but counterpoint. Okay, I I'd did love to hear. hear it. Okay, I did hear that scientists are using AI to try to figure out how to speak whale language. Ooh, I love so, that. It's Ocean Girl. Did you ever see that show? No. Has, has anyone ever seen the TV show Ocean Girl? Thank you. I That's love what? it. I love Identify it. Identify yourself. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> There was a TV show in like the early 2000s where there was this alien from outer space who swam in the ocean and could speak to whales. It was great. Anyway, so, yeah. go ahead. We're finally there. And <laughs> so like everyone loses their job. And you think you're but weird. But Ocean Girl. <laughs> I, don't, I mean, it's, it's terrifying and it absolutely cannot... I don't see how it's contained. You can't like stop nerds from doing stuff no, in their computer. Really really like can't. case in point. Hey, you guys, <laughs> please don't make this evil. Just, do, just don't. Remember just when don't Google said work. that they weren't going to be evil? What? When Google said they weren't going to be oh evil? My oh God. yeah, oh that's <laughs> bone that was chilling. So long ago. <laughs> I know. I, anyway, I mean, it does feel like we're on a precipice because also, you know what is what I think we don't really take into account is what exponential means. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. It means really fast. <laughs> so, really big. I'll, I'll, you, we're, we're, you said it feels like we're on the precipice, and I don't disagree. I want to know what you think we're on the precipice of. I don't know. <laughs> no, come on. Give me a real I mean, answer. Well, when I say, there, it just feels like there are so many different possibilities for the the repercussions of AI that I can't my brain's not I would need an AI to tell me yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, right. but you know when you start to think about it which I try to, to not do um, it, it's like it, 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 it's it's very obviously there are could be exciting um, um, implementations but um, for the most part it feels like a lot of people are going to not have jobs, and also it is it wants to be evil. I, I mean, I don't have anything to add be, beyond what we've already doom and gloomed about, but, That's all right. but you guys are supposed to make me smart. So uh, will yeah. you tell me oh, what I should snap. No, 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 you're the special guest. We're asking you questions. You gotta, you gotta help us out. Which, if uh, switching to another topic about which you've written a great deal, um, which is embracing being fat. How do you do that in the age of Ozempic? <laughs> I don't know. Because, I think we lost. <laughs> right? Because there was so much action on the body positivity and fat positive, and now it's like if you're wealthy or have good insurance, you can take an injection and not be fat anymore. Okay, well, here, I will say that the wealthy already had access to not being fat anymore. True. So True. maybe, like, fine, you guys are a little bit less fat, a little bit even more not fat than before. Um, I mean, it feels like eugenics. It feels really, uh, it's very disturbing. It also is, seems bad for you um, I, and not worth it to, I mean, it seems like it feels bad to take it and also maybe damages your body in yet unknown ways. But people have always been willing to 
be miserable and damage their bodies in order to not be fat. So, mm. um, but there's not that much new about it except that yeah, it's it it, it seems like a a quicker fix than ever. Um, but I I'm specifically interested in all of that work yeah. that went into changing the narrative around fat people in this country and how fat people feel about themselves living in their bodies. And now this. I mean, I think that people still need that messaging. Mm -hmm. I think that thin people need that messaging too. And people who have become thin from taking Ozempic also need that messaging because what it comes down to is, uh, you know, fundamentally being alienated from your body and being told that your physicality is more important than anything else about you. And um, that's just not true. And that's really, I mean, that's a really, it's a simplistic thing to say, but it's, it's just not true. And it's really um, uh, corrosive, I think, to your soul <laughs> to live in that place. Um, you know, just like uh, people are still going to have eating disorders and people are still going to hate themselves. And hating yourself, hating your body and hating yourself isn't just confined to that one area. You know, mm. it, it um, uh, resonates in every other part of your life and the way that you carry yourself and the way that you treat other people and the way that you allow yourself to be treated. So I don't feel like I wasted my time. And mm. also, most of us don't have an extra $1,000 a month. Because <laughs> yeah. um, like I said, we're being ground down into dust. And so, um, I don't know, it feels... I mostly feel sad for people who feel like this is what they need to do. You need to be, you know, nauseated all day, every day, and damage your liver so that you don't look like me. Um, I have a good life, and I'm a good person, and I'm happy. So, um, <laughs> it's, it, it's the power of the narrative is something, though, because I've had three separate people in my life unsolicited suggest that I get on Ozempic. No, really? Yes. You need to shut those people out of your life. <laughs> well, I mean, what's really but that's, hard? That's how powerful it is, right? This, you must be thin. No matter what it does to you, no matter how healthy you think you are, you have to be thin. And, like, I was like, I'm not diabetic. That's appalling. That's a. I'm not pre-diabetic, and I actually was feeling okay about myself today. <laughs> until, until right there. <laughs> But uh, then I was reading your book and then your other one, you know, and I was just like, wow, you're right about the strength of the narrative and that people feel like unsolicited. Yeah, you know, this is so easy. Why don't you just take the pill, uh, the injection, which is going to be a pill soon, you know? Well, and what's really sad, really devastatingly sad, is that people treat you better when you're smaller. Mm. And... I, lots and lots of people who have done this work, like me, you know, we even, I can't escape the feeling that my life would be better if I was smaller. And there are going to be fat people who take this medication even though they know that it, it you know, that even if you think that you're good the way that you are and you really believe in fat liberation and body liberation, there are still going to be people who take Ozempic because being fat is hard. Um, and it's really, really hard to go through life uh, not fitting, in not being accommodated and not being treated well. And it is easier... <laughs> in certain ways to lose weight than to try to change an entire system that is built to exclude you. Mm. So it's mm -hmm. just like really, really, really devastating. And also we know from people getting bariatric surgery 
that even when people lose 200 pounds and they think this is what's going to fix their life, it doesn't, and they're still unhappy. Mm. So uh, what is it fixing? What is it fixing? Other than, you know, again, being able to move through your life without being um, treated poorly, (laughs) which is big, but... Yeah, yeah. no, it's huge. Um, So let's turn to some questions. Once again, if you've got a card, it might be a little late because we've got a stash up here, but if you've got a card, track down Courtney or or Marissa or somebody and they'll get them up here if it's a good one. Um, Let me just pick one from the pile that I just gave to Kimberly, just as a way to sort of transition. What would you do professionally if you weren't doing this? Oh my gosh. Well, what would I do professionally? If I wasn't a... If you weren't a writer, if you weren't, you know, a person with opinions and thoughts and creativity. (laughs) Look, there are a lot of people out there like that. Oh, I would really... I feel like the dream that pulls at me through social media is that I would like to have a property where I take in sad animals. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Because they will like, love you. They will unconditionally. Yeah. They will love me. They don't care how fat I am. They just want me to bring them snacks. Like, I, I will follow any kind of, like, like wacky farm or like you know any uh, any niche animal rescue fox rescue pig rescue um fox where did fox come from are we rescuing fox because i follow a fox rescue and just, it's <laughs> and they of mind make, and there's this one that like my the life fox is, so boring. is so happy to see her and he like loses their mind every time she shows up it's so cute yeah I feel like I would like to be just like a dirty woman, <laughs> like making a pig happy. <laughs> Subscribe wow. to the newsletter, Butt but News. Like... Sorry, sorry. It just seemed like the segue. So speaking of unconditional love, the two of you were talking about your golden retrievers backstage. because they Yes, we were. Come on. Retrievers. What are their names? Uh, mine is named, yeah, mine's named Barry. And, and mine is named Willow. And somebody asked, how many dogs do you have? I have two. I would have like four or five, but sadly I'm married and, you know. That, uh, <laughs> Ooh. She's not going to hear this, by the way, so it's all good. <laughs> I was about to say, careful there. <laughs> all right, this is a quick one. What's your favorite anime of all time? It's called Mushishi. And it is... <laughs> some, wow. Got some people who love hardcore. it. It is about a sort of loner dude who travels the wilderness of feudal Japan, finding sort of spirits and rescuing them from people who would like abuse them. There like me on my farm. Exactly. She is the mushi. She of like real life animals. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. Let's uh, let's see. This one's, I guess, mostly for you, Kai. What does it indicate that the Fed may pause interest rates this year? Oh my God! You know what the best part is? This is the first time that the Fed has come up in this entire podcast, which <laughs> for which I am incredibly I know, grateful. Wild. What does it indicate? It indicates, uh, so look, the Fed meets on the 13th and 14th of June. Uh, The decision on interest rates will come out on the 14th. There is a big debate now about whether they're going to skip a meeting, that is to say just let it sit there for a minute and then maybe take up the next meeting as a live meeting, or whether they're going to pause for a substantial period of time. I think it only means that they want more data. They want to see what's going on out there, and they see no harm now. Having raised interest rates from zero to 5% in where are we, June, 15 months, um, they're just going to hang out for a minute. So I don't think you should read too much in it. They're going to take a month off, or a meeting off, and then, and then the next meeting will be live. Good question, though. Yeah. The unsigned, unfortunately. We'd give you credit otherwise. Yeah. Paulina, who did sign, <laughs> wanted to know, what keeps you up at night? Right there. Climate change. Yeah. Obviously. <laughs> uh, every night. <laughs> Oh, I got some fillings done yesterday, and I got to have the nitrous. And for one minute, I was like, I don't care about climate change. <laughs> oh, man. It was incredible. I'm getting ready to go back to the East Coast and breathe in climate change. No, the uh, air today was great. I saw it. It was great. Was it? In oh, in yeah, DC? it was like in the green in D.C. Okay. Yeah, Dude, we sure. had smoke here for like a month I once. Like, yeah, I saw that. Um, but actually, 
I do want to ask you about something that hopefully doesn't keep you up at night, but hopefully makes you feel good about your upcoming book, uh, Adult Braces. We didn't ask you about that. So what is it about? Oh, um, I'm writing an, another memoir. Um, it's called Adult Braces because I had braces during COVID. Um, they're gone now. Uh, but I, yeah. I Invisalign. Had, like, do Invisalign. I did not do Invisalign. <laughs> I had metal braces <laughs> glued on my teeth like a third grader. Because I don't trust myself to do Invisalign. I do not trust myself to wear the tray if I can take it out. I was like, I was like, uh, weld it to my teeth. So I have no choice. Uh, so I'm using that as kind of a metaphor for um, a lot of different changes that I've made in my life over the last few years and ways that I um, needed structure and um, help moving things around. <laughs> Hmm. Um, because uh, there's a lot of things that I feel like uh, we we think we can't change, and I certainly felt that my life was sort of fixed and done, and I was like just sliding along until death, and um, hmm. that's not true. And did you know that all of your teeth are separate and floating <laughs> in your head, ah. and you can just move them around? <laughs> and so... Um, well, I had wow. kid braces, so that's, I know that. That's a little disturbing, but okay. Yeah, it's not, it's not nice, but, um, you know, my getting braces coincided with not exactly a midlife crisis, but, you know, everything, all, as we all experienced, suddenly was very scary and confusing, and I just, I woke up one day, and I was like, I gotta do something else, <laughs> and I... Um, rented a van and I drove from Seattle to Key West and back. Wow. No way. Yeah, with my braces. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, ju just you? Just me. Oh, I wow. slept in the van. Um, every single woman I met on the road was like, oh my God, I could never do that. And I was like, <laughs> you, I mean, maybe, maybe we shouldn't. It might not be safe, but I'm doing it anyway. <laughs> and you should do it. Um, it was really amazing. So that's what the book is about. What's your favorite place? that you visited along the way? Okay, it was not what I expected. Okay. Um, and I, I deliberately went to places that I have never been, you know, so I cut straight, like, diagonally across. I went sure. to Arkansas, and um, I visited my cousin in Kansas, and I went to a, a lot of, you know, places that, in this fragmented time, uh, feel like they're not mine, mm -hmm. and... Um, it was, that was kind of healing in this way, but anyway, my favorite, my two favorite places on the trip were, you're, you would never guess them. Would not. Uh, Tallahassee <laughs> and uh, Kalamazoo, Michigan. Oh. And wow. I just had, so in Tallahassee, there are, I didn't even spend time really in the city of Tallahassee, but there are like a million natural springs mm. in the sort of panhandle region. And they're like crystal blue water that comes up from the ground in like a jungle glade. Oh they and do then a you lot can... of mermaid shoots there, actually. Yes, <laughs> it looks like where mermaids live. And so I just spent this sort of magical three days with a couple of friends who live there, like swimming in these magical swimming holes and eating um, soft shell crab. And then nice. Uh, I'm like obsessed with the Midwest, and I feel very at home there. And Kalamazoo is. Visit I, St. Louis, it's great. Yeah, exactly. I didn't go to St. Louis, but that's, I'm, I'm gonna do this again, because now I, all I think about is vans. <laughs> like, and, which is so cliche at this point, but I, it's real. It was really fun. Van life. So anyway, um, it was sort of really felt special to connect with these parts of America. Like I'm from Seattle. Uh, I grew up here, my parents grew up here. Uh, we all went to the same high school. Like, I, and it's, Seattle's such a bubble and I'm such a like blue state, blue city bubble girl, and it was really nice to get out of that and move my body through parts of the country that feel alien to me, which I no longer do, you know? That's yeah, amazing. That's great. I said we, we ended like right there. Lindy West, you are yes, awesome. Thank that's you so much. a wonderful much. place to end this. Yeah, you did a great job. Thank you. How about that, huh? I want to I grow up and be Lindy West. No joke, right? <laughs> God.
Climb in a van and drive to Key West. Okay. Yeah. Van, it was, it's, it was a thing for a while. Hashtag was awesome. van life. Awesome. We did a story on that, didn't we? We did? Yeah. Many. Many. On the vans. All righty then. Okay. So, Lindy West, amazing. One more round of applause for her. All right, before we leave for the night, it wouldn't be right to end Make Me Smart without our Make Me Smiles. Charles the Dorp, on well it. Well done, he's on it. So All right, timely, perfect. Okay, so let me see if I can figure out this new fancy iPad. I can't, do yours first. All right, so I'll do mine first. <laughs> so uh, we just had the first mention of the Fed in this podcast. I would do the second mention of the Fed in this podcast. There was a picture about three or four days ago of the chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank of the United States of America, Jay Powell, at a Grateful Dead and Company concert. <laughs> My neighbors went to that on a school bus. There was a giant school bus outside my apartment when I was heading to the airport, and all these deadheads were like, hey, everybody's out. going to see Dead and Company. Anyway, <laughs> included in that crowd is one Jerome S. Powell, chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank. So, Jake Sherman, who's a political reporter in Washington, put that out on Twitter, and it, of course, exploded on Econ Twitter. And so, Barron's, which, which is, is a thing, Econ Twitter. Econ Twitter is a real thing. So, Adam Serwer at Barron's followed up, and here's what he writes. Another perhaps more surprising connection between the Fed and the dead concerns how the band, band's current bass player, Otile Burbridge, first learned about the Grateful Dead. In a 2015 interview, Burbridge said, and this is a quote, my earliest memory is of an old friend named Monica Powell giving me like six of their records when I was in high school. The source in this article said Monica Powell is Jerome Powell's sister and that the record she gave to Burbridge, the drummer for the Dead and Company, belonged to her brother, the future Fed chair. <laughs> I mean, come on, come on. Amazing. Come on. <laughs> All right, so I really wanted to find a local make me smile. And so of course I went to KUOW's website. Yeah, <laughs> yes. buddy. Karen and Mathis is applauding for that one. I see that. And I found this story by one Bill Radke. Yo, Bill. You want to give them a little history on Bill? Bill, Bill used to host the Marketplace Morning Report back in the day. He was there for a couple of three years. Now, uh, back up in Seattle. Yes. And Bill reports that there is a new breed of Washington apple, which I did not know about because you clearly cannot have too many, too many Washington, Washington apples. apples. Right. But I'm, apparently they took the flowers of a pink lady tree and just dusted that pollen on the flowers of a honeycrisp. And this offspring is so called so far called WA-64. There you go. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> I'm hoping the rest of you all can help these people come up with a better name for that. <laughs> it's going to be the crispy or something. Anyway, yeah. that is Make Me Smart live in Seattle. We'd yes. love to hear from you because if you can't do this show without you, as we say all the time, if you've got a question you'd like us to answer, comment, suggestion, we can do that too. Make me smart at marketplace.org or... 508, you be smart. There you go. I love that they actually knew the number. I know, right? It's amazing. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> you guys are great. Today's special live edition of Make Me Smart was produced by the Make Me Smart crew and KUOW's event team and the fine folks here at Town Hall Seattle. Thank you all so much. <laughs> <laughs>